Okay. We are on YouTube now. So welcome to our CFM seminar number uh, 22. Today we are we are very happy to have Professor uh, Zhao Xu Meng to give a talk on the bio-inspired material. So Dr. Uh, Zhao Xu Meng is currently an assist, assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Clemson University. So before joining Clemson, he was a Chiang Mai postdoc fellow at the Northwestern University, to where he obtained his PhD in civil engineering in uh, 2018. So he, uh, Dr. Meng received his bachelor degree from the Honor College of Beihang University, China in uh, 2013. And Dr. Meng's research focused on the computational mechanics and multi-scale modeling of nanomaterial and bio-inspired materials. So Dr. Mom, please start your seminar. All right, yeah, uh, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I hope this, this video is also live in, in YouTube and it will also save in YouTube. I uh, hope uh, some, uh, some other uh, people will enjoy uh, this video afterwards after this live session. So yeah, today I will give a talk on bio-inspired structural materials by design, some of uh, my early work and, and some of our recent work from our group. Uh, but first of all, I would like to briefly take this opportunity to briefly introduce uh, Clemson University and, and my group. Uh, speaking of Clemson University, I think the first thing that came into mind uh, would be our uh, Clemson football team. So we have one, we are very proud to have won uh, three national championships, and uh, one of the latest one being in 2018, uh, one year before we joined Clemson. Uh, so, so it's weird that uh, since we joined Clemson, we haven't won a national championship since then, but hopefully we have a, a, a good opportunity next year as well. Uh, I think for all the incoming graduate students, you will have uh, uh, one free ticket to one of the football games per your choice. Uh, yeah, you can really experiencing uh, this uh, this excitement being in this stadium, um, and and also comes and an, an, another important thing that to me is this is a very uh, good scenery here, um, and you can have a very good work uh, life balance here. Uh, so Clemson is at the foot of a blue hill. So it's by a hill uh, and also by a, a lake, and that lake called uh, Lake Hartwell. Uh, it's, it's really beautiful here. And another thing here is it's re really uh, trail and hiking friendly. So this, this orange region is our campus, which is already very large, right? But those green region are the forest areas owned by Clemson. So there are millions of trails in uh, embedded in those uh, those uh, green area um, in the fall uh, season, uh, which is very long, which is a very long season. So you can go out there and, and, and have a very good hiking. Um, yeah, I think this is uh, Clemson really uh, has a, a, a very good walk and life balance. So you can enjoy every thing and every scenery here. Um, and speaking of our group, uh, we have uh, several interests. The first of uh, the first part of it is a bio-inspired structural material by design. I will talk about this part uh, majority in, uh, in this talk. But we also have other part of research that aim to understand the uh, deformation and, and mechanical properties of uh, composites and non-composites, so which is a more uh, problem-driven research. Uh, well, here is a more hypothesis and, and, and material design driven research. And we are always welcome uh, students to join us. Uh, if you are interested, you can contact me by uh, sending me an email here. Um, yeah, so regarding the first part of the research, which is bio-inspired structural material by design. Uh, so the goal is we want to develop structural materials that can benefit a broad range of applications, right? So from uh, those skyscrapers to spacecraft to racing cars, as well as our future laptop, all those things, we would need structural materials that, that is stronger, tougher, lighter, and in general better. But to design materials with such uh, prop properties simultaneously, like high strength, high toughness, uh, in the meantime, lightweight, that's a grand challenge. Uh, uh, 
I don't think this challenge has been well addressed yet, uh, considering that all the current engineered materials we have right now, they <laughs> face a trade-off uh, between the toughness and, and, and stiffness or stress. Right? So when you design a material that is more and more strong, you ultimately lose the toughness of it. Uh, in other sense, like when you, uh, the, the material becomes stronger, it becomes less deformable or le less tough uh, of those engineered materials, right? So that's a, that's a challenge we are facing right now. Um, so one possible way to address this challenge is to look into nature for help or for inspiration. A lot of biological materials, uh, for instance, our human bone uh, and our uh, dentin and enamel, uh, which is also a type of bone structure, as well as some uh, of other materials in uh, uh, mollusk shell and, and, and other material uh, and other species, those materials defy the trade-off between toughness and strength. So this seems to optimize both uh, stiffness and, and, and strength and, and toughness at the same time. So if we look into the reasons of why it can optimize both properties, uh, the reason because they have this, this very complex and multi-level structures. Uh, basically there's structure within structure and it has a structure from nanoscale uh, all the way to the centimeter scale, right? So take uh, uh, this spider silk as an example. So spider silk mainly made of a protein, but it was found that this uh, nanometer scale structure of the protein is made of crystalline domain and amorphous domain. So crystalline domain mainly offers a stress, while the amorphous domain mainly offers the, this toughness. So with all those delicate structures, all those biomaterials achieve very good opportunities, uh, uh, properties. So, uh, so we uh, would like to look into why, right? Why certain materials achieve such excellent properties and then perhaps take the most important structural features and then apply those structural features to our currently available building blocks. So uh, only speaking, so our currently uh, the building blocks that are much, much better than the building blocks used in biological materials. Uh, biological materials are just like soft protein and some, some very brittle calcium, right? Uh, calcium crystals, right? So those building blocks are meager, but the building blocks that we have already synthesized and created recently are much, much better. Uh, for instance, we have this carbon nanotube or graphene sheet, uh, which is much, much stronger uh, than other materials. Uh, we also have synthetic polymers, which can serve a, a, a broad range of needs, right? So we have polymers that can provide toughness, we can poly have polymers that can provide high strength, right? Uh, so in addition to those, uh, we also have this uh, biomaterials that we can extract from uh, from, from different species, uh, from, from different uh, uh, resources. Say we have this cellul cellulose nanocrystal nanofibers that we can readily extract uh, from uh, trees. Uh, uh, so these nanofibers give, uh, give rise to the strength of the tree so that it can stand tall and, and, and resist high wind. Uh, so these nanofibers, they have very good uh, properties. So this is red uh, dot here. So it has very good, uh, like E over rho, which is the uh, specific modulus, as well as specific strengths, right? So those uh, building blocks we have we currently have, so they are they are excellent. So if we can combine those building blocks and and borrow the structure features that are key to give rise a good properties to biological materials, so then we can yeah, somehow make a synthetic materials that can perform much much better. Uh, not only for our, for uh, biological materials, but for all the our current engineered materials. So that's uh, that's the research theme that uh, that we have now. Um, but in order to utilize those advanced building blocks into material design, um, so sometimes only using experiments will be like very expensive, right? So you you cannot uh, just uh, do experiments all the time. So we want to have some computational tool to help us utilize those building blocks to, to design materials. Well, traditionally people use uh, atomistic simulations, but that is very expensive. So in order to accelerate the material design process, we, uh, we also devoted certain efforts into developing cost grain models for those building blocks, which I will talk about in a minute. Um, yeah, so just uh, to summarize our research synopsis, 
Uh, the first thing we're gonna learn from nature, we, we want to learn like what typical structures uh, and property relationship that, that that are, right? So we want to learn like which structure give rise to which type of uh, excellent properties. And then we're gonna apply those uh, structure uh, property relationship uh, on uh, our current advanced building blocks. Uh, and then use that into competitional design and characterization framework. So basically we use computational models to design materials and, and, and test them uh, to just to, to, to replace some of the very expensive experiments. So eventually we want to integrate those insights into advanced manufacturing process. And, and hopefully in the near future, we can make those excellent materials that can has been envisioned in our sci-fi movies. Uh, for instance, this uh, armor of Black Panther. Um, yeah, so all, the, the first part of, of my talk, I will talk, uh, uh, so I will introduce our previous cultural models for uh, different building blocks, uh, say graphene, graphene oxide sheet, uh, as well as this uh, cellulose nanocrystal uh, fibers. So cross-grain model basically is we combine several atoms into one large bead, right? So in this case, in this sense, we're gonna degrade, uh, decrease the degree of freedom. Um, and, and, and increase the computation efficiency. Um, so take the graphene sheets as an example. Uh, so basically we combine every four carbon atom into a blue large bead. So this is a four to one mapping here. Um, so, so by doing this, so we combine every four, this, this uh, gray atom into a, a blue bead. In this way, we still conserve this hexagonal symmetry. Right? We still have a hexagonal sheet. And later we will show that by conserving this hexagonal sheet, we can capture many of the intrinsic mechanical properties of graphene sheets. Um, even with this just four to one mapping, because we increase the time step and we we also simplify the force field for the graphene. Yeah, by the way, we redevelop the potentials of the uh, model of the Cosgrove model of graphene so that we can capture the targeted mechanical property of graphene sheets. And we use very simple but effective a uh, force field, so it uh, significantly increases the computational speed uh, of of the model comparing to let's say reactive force field or uh, rebel and aerial that commonly used for atomistic simulation of graphene. And finally, we achieve uh, two to three orders of magnitude compared to those uh, reactive or atomistic and simulations. Uh, well, in our our model, because we uh, the we calculate and uh, we design the force field by matching the mechanical property. And later we found that because we capture this intrinsic hexagonal lattice, we also capture this anisotropic mechanical behavior. So namely, when you tension in zigzag, it is a bit stronger well, compared to when you apply tension in the armchair direction. Uh, because we conserve this hexagonal, hexagonal symmetry, uh, we can also capture this anisotropic mechanical be behavior of graphene. Um, and our model can also capture the, the failure behavior of graphene, uh, also the dynamic failure behavior by adopting a breakable bonds uh, in the cost model. So later we tested that our model can also capture this highly dynamic uh, projectile impact test uh, that was recently uh, uh, developed uh, in the experimental side. So in experiments, they can shoot very small projectiles into those graphene sheets and measure how it can absorb energy under this high strain rate deformation. Uh, and we also carry out simulation, which gave us more in depth of the insights into this highly dynamic process. Uh, and, and the reason is uh, our model can capture those dynamic uh, fracture of graphene sheets. So you see that the, the fracture behavior of the graphene agrees very well with those uh, experimental results. Um, another uh, building block is graphene oxide. Uh, graphene oxide, basically there are oxidation group on the plane of, uh, of the uh, uh, sheet, of the uh, mainly carbon sheet. Um, and GO, they have two advanced compared to graphene. The first thing is uh, GO is more easily dispersed in solvents and polymer matrices. So when you mix uh, graphene oxide and polymer, so it's more, uh, it's, it, it will be dispersed very much better uh, uh, for those graphene oxide sheets into polymer matrices, which leads to enhanced mechanical property of the resulting nanocomposites. So one of the early work shows that by embedding graphene oxide into uh, polymer matrix, namely the PMMA matrix, 
it achieves, so this green bar here is achieve a much better modular strength and, and glass transition temperature. So GO seems to be a better enforcement in our composites. Uh, however, GO has a very complex and, and I would say heterogeneous mechanical property because it is uh, different from graphene. So graphene is, is uh, just uh, a perfect material uh, uh, and the mechanical property basically uh, is uh, it, 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 constant. So it's just, uh, uh, it's a well-known property. But GO, uh, the, the mechanical properties are influenced not only by the degree of oxidation, Right. So namely the coverage of those oxidation types, it also depends on the type of oxidation. Um, so our previous uh, collaborators using the FTB calculation, and they found that when a GO sheet uh, fully functionalized by hydroxyl group, it has very brittle behavior. Well, if there are certain, uh, there are many epoxy group on the GO sheet, it has this ductile behavior and, and the failure strength can, can achieve very high, right? So this GO sheet not only depends on the degree of oxidation, it also depends on the oxidation time. Um, so we, when we develop the cost per model of GO, we need to consider all those effects because we want our cost per model to capture all this dependence. Uh, so how, how did we do that? So our solution is we assign different element types uh, or different B types to represent uh, one is hydroxyl oxidation, the other is epoxide oxidation. And because we introduce different B types, we also introduce different angle and bound types and we specifically design those, those angle and, and, and bound and also non-bounded interactions, we can capture those heterogeneous mechanical properties of the GO sheet. Uh, so let, uh, let me show the results. So the Cosmer model, which is a right line here, it captured this dependence on oxidation type. So our model captures that for epoxy oxidation, we can have elastic plastic deformation uh, and the failure strength can reach to like 20%. While the hydroxyl oxidation, it, it has a, a brittle behavior. So our model by just adopting those, those different groups uh, are representing different oxidation type, the model can capture this uh, unique dependence. Uh, also uh, this uh, decreasing modulus, versus degree of oxidation, our cost per model can also capture very well uh, compared to, to those DFT uh, predictions. Um, uh, so we also have a, a model for cellulose nanocrystal uh, nanofibers. Um, so due to the time limit, so I, I didn't include the application of this model, but you can check my website and to see how we have applied this model of CNC to address different uh, cellulose nanocrystal microstructures or like microstructure made of nanofibers. Um, well, this model is, is a highly cost grain model. So namely, we combine every 4,500 4, atoms into one super cost grain bead. So this, we, we decrease the degree of freedom to a large extent. Um, well, the, 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 we aim to use this model to capture this nanofiber properties uh, just by using very simple potentials like it's, it's like a, a base spring model, we can capture those nanofiber properties uh, and, and also the uh, adhesion behavior between different nanofibers. And this seems to suffice for our targeted application because we want to use this, this cost model to study nanofiber uh, uh, ultra structures. Right, so because there are many structures made of nano uh, cellulose nanocrystal nanofibers, we aim to use this Cosmos model to study those ultra structures. Yeah, you can uh, like if you are interested in this part of work, and you can reach out to me and again uh, introduce more uh, work using this uh, this uh, model of cellulose nanocrystal. Um, recently, we also uh, developed a Cosmos model for epoxy resin. So if you are familiar with epoxy resin, um, uh, I think uh, like two uh, like two weeks ago, Dr. Ying Li, uh, he introduced uh, his work on, on, on modeling of epoxies. So you would uh, know that epoxy resin typically made of a resin and a hardener or a curing agent. So it has two components, at least two components. Um, so when we cost grain this system, we will, if we will just, uh, just differentiate the, 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 the resin and the uh, curing agent, we would introduce many types of bees uh, into the model. Uh, so with this many types of bees, when you calibrate the cost model, there are many degree of freedom. 
right? Uh, and, 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 and that's usually leads to uh, quite a challenge because how you're gonna uh, calculate all those different parameters uh, simultaneously to match these targeted properties. Uh, to, to address this challenge, we have applied a machine learning algorithm, uh, namely uh, Gaussian process meta modeling. So that is basically a surrogate model to predict the response of cost square model as a function of this model parameters, uh, model parameters, namely the, uh, the, the force field parameters for those cost grain Bs. And once we have the surrogate model, yeah, it, it's very cheap to, to tune different sites of uh, input model and, 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 and predict the response of the cost grain model. Uh, and, and then, so once we have this targeted property uh, of the cost grain model, basically we want, uh, like what type of property we want our cost grain model to match. So in this case, we want our cost grain model to match the glass transition temperature and uh, also the mechanical and, and, and thermal properties of, of, uh, of the epoxy redden. Uh, then we just use this machine learning model to help us optimize a set of uh, force field parameters so that our cost grain model can, uh, can, can, uh, can very accurately match our targeted properties. Uh, so this, this work was also recently published uh, and we're gonna, uh, so if you're interested, you can read this paper here uh, and, and, and if you have questions, let me know. But in, in because in terms of the time limit, I, I'm gonna skip the application of the epoxy model and, and cellulose model. So just to summarize um, our cost model development, so we have a developed cost model for many uh, building blocks. Um, and the, the key feature of our cost grain model is that we, we aim to retain the molecular feature uh, as much as possible. So graphene, we aim to conserve this hexagonal lattice. Um, and for this nanofiber, we, we, we just conserve this fiber structure. And for this uh, epoxy resin, yeah, we just uh, capture this, this different uh, resin and, and cross-linker chemical structure by using much simplified uh, 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 the cost grain uh, beads. Um, so by doing this, we found that this is uh, also uh, advantageous to capture some of the key mechanical properties of different systems. So for graphene, we can capture this anisotropic behavior and also interlayer shear. Um, and graphene oxide, we can capture the unique dependence on uh, oxidation type and, and oxidation degree. And epoxy resin, yeah, because we differentiate the, uh, the resin and hardener, and then we can capture this unique dependence on different component ratio and, and cross-linking degree. And we, in, in all this cost grain model, we have shown that those models can well capture this uh, chemical and structural heterogeneities, heterogeneities um, just rooted in those material systems. Um, and our model, uh, because we aim to use those models to capture the mechanical properties, so all those models, the, the, the force field parameters are uniquely designed to capture the, mecha the, the mechanical properties of different systems. Okay, yeah, so after developing those cost grain models, <clears throat> we have applied those models to understand uh, nanostructure material system and help us design, also design material systems. <clears throat> so next, uh, I would like to, to discuss uh, uh, two examples. Uh, of uh, how we use these cost grain models to study graphene polymer nanocomposites and study the features that are traditionally very difficult to be studied using all atomistic simulations. The first example is a GO, a graphene oxide reinforced polymer nanocomposites. So uh, all previous atomistic simulations uh, in previous studies, uh, they have studied GO and uh, typical GO and polymer nanocomposites. <clears throat> However, those models are usually limited in size, right? So they, they are only limited in a few or a tens of nanometers, and that's already like very computationally expensive. Uh, well, those small GO sheets, it's hard to uh, study a few missile scale or, uh, or some, some larger scale features. One of the key features in GO sheet is that the oxidation group, which is those darker regions here, uh, it, it's not random distributed in the geo sheet. So instead it will form patches, irregular fit patches. Well, those graphitic region is a more regular shape patches, right? So this oxidation region and, 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 and 
and graphitic region, they form this patchy structure. Well, this, this structure features has been traditionally very difficult to be captured using atomistic simulation. So now we have a Cosper model, and this Cosper model can enable us to reach a, a, a larger system. So then we, we use our Cosper model to design graphene oxide sheets that have different patchy structure. So here, this blue region is a graphitic region, and red region are the oxidized oxi 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 region. Right? So we can so in those different systems here, the overall ratio of the blue over red uh, bees or over red regions, they are constant. The only difference is the patchy structure. One, there's only one large patch structure. And on the other uh, extreme cases, we have randomized uh, di uh, distribution of those, those blue beads. So now let's see if we change this, <coughs> this geo structure, uh, how it influences the mechanical property of, of, of the graphene oxide, uh, of the geo polymer nanocomposites. And this system we use a, a well-developed a PB polybutadiene uh, polymer model. So this is uh, a, a key component for synthetic rubber. rubber right? so it's, a, it's a very viscoelastic uh, a polymer system. So yeah, so we after design this this uh, this nanocomposite system, we apply a oscillatory shear. So by doing this oscillatory shear simulation, we can study the viscoelastic property of the nanocomposites. So this is basically we do this oscillatory shear and we can capture this a G prime, the, the, the storage modulus, a loss modulus, and tangent delta. Right? So I just want to, to, to draw your attention to those different columns here. So this different group of columns, they are this different patchy structure. So M equal to one means there's only one large patch structure. Well, M equal to 64, there are many small patches. Right? By changing the patchy structure, it also changed the uh, storage modulus quite a lot. Right? This means that Tuning the patchy structure of GO it also gave us a, 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 a lever that can tune the dynamic moduli of nanocomposites. So in the future, when you use experimental uh, methods to characterize uh, the, the, the viscoelastic properties of this uh, GO polymer nanocomposites, you should also consider the influence of the unique patchy structure uh, uh, in the properties. Right? So our simulations show that Okay, so this GO, because it has different implant structures, this can also play a, a very important role in the mechanical property of the system. Okay, so next, um, so graphene polymer nanocomposites. Um, uh, one key feature in previous atomistic studies is that it fails to capture this highly wrinkled configuration of graphene. Right? So when you run an uh, atomistic simulation, you are you're really limited in the size of graphene uh, uh, graphene sheet. Uh, and you, you tend to just simulate a very flat graphene sheet. However, that's not usually the case. When you embed a graphene sheet, a large graphene sheet in a polymer matrix, it results in this highly wrinkled or even crumpled uh, configuration. Well, how those wrinkle and crumple uh, configuration of graphene influence the graphene polymer nanocomposites. Um, so we, we take the first step to study uh, this influence. So our first step is, okay, so now we, we just ha have a Cosmer model. We use a Cosmer model for both graphene and the Cosmer model for PMMA, and we design a, uh, a just a Cosmer model for nanocomposites. And here we just uni uniquely de design and define this wrinkle wrinkled feature. So this is from the side view. So we de define the wrinkle feature of graphene, and, and, and the, the, so this we can generate different system and the different system they have this different wrinkle configuration of graphene sheets. So one interesting thing that we observe when doing the uh, uniaxial shear of those different nanocomposites, we found that for a certain system, so for this wrinkle configuration, when you shear the nanocomposites, the, uh, we have a bilayer graphene sheets here. So they're also initiate the interlayer sliding of the graphene. Well, this behavior does not happen in flat and other wrinkle configurations. So this just, just intrigued us, okay, why this, uh, this interlayer sliding of graphene happens in this case. So we go ahead and, and apply SMD pooling. So basically we fix the uh, lower layer of the graphene sheet while conserving this wrinkle configuration, different wrinkle configurations. And we pull this, this upper graphene sheet towards left. 
Okay, so we observe a very interesting thing that is for for certain configuration, which is L equals 20. So L is the uh the periodicity of the sinusoidal wave. So it's, it's a lever that we control uh, the wrinkle configuration. So we found that for this wrinkle configuration specifically, the interlayer shear shear force to initiate the sliding is much smaller, right? So this is quite interesting that hasn't been observed before. That is when the graphene sheets become a, a bit wrinkled, uh, the interlayer shear resistance becomes lower, uh, basically much lower than the, than the flat graphene sheet. Right? So this basically, when the graphene becomes more wrinkled, uh, it's poss poss possible that the graphene can slide against each other uh, using, uh, like more easily, right? This, so later we also found that this interlayer sliding activated in the shear deformation of nanocomposites also leads to a large tangent delta or large uh, like uh, energy dissipation capability uh, of the nanocomposites, right? This is quite interesting. So when you design nanocomposites, when you have wrinkled configuration, so when you share the nanocomposites, the, the interlayer sliding can be activated. And when this interlayer sliding of graphene sheets are activated, it can dissipate quite a large amount of energy. Uh, so you can actually increase the energy dissipation capability of uh, those nanocomposites. And this is usually uh, very favorable when you design energy absorption uh, nanocomposites. So when you want this uh, mature system to absorb energy under like dynamic loading conditions. Right? And our, our results found that, okay, so this graphene wrinkle, wrinkleness is also a, a factor that you can control that, that can, can influence the uh, energy dissipation capability of nanocomposites. So to summarize this, this two example studies, uh, we found that, okay, so by taking advantage of the cost square model, we can study a few features that has been traditionally uh, difficult to be modeled using atomistic simulation. So these features include um, the uh, physical feature of graphene sheets, which is the, the wrinkled configurations, and the chemical feature of the graphene oxide sheets, right, which is that the, it has this patchy structure between oxidation group and, and graphitic group. So specifically, we found that <clears throat> the, the, um, like the graphene uh, polymer nanocomposites, the, the properties can be tuned through wrinkle engineering of multi-layer graphene sheets. A certain wrinkle configuration of graphene, it can make the interlayer sliding easier, and le which leads to increased energy dissipation capability. We also found that this graphitic, to so this patchy structure of GO sheets also influence the viscoelastic property of geo polymer on the components. Right, so this is uh, the first uh, part of the case study. So where we have applied the cost growth model to understand a few things. So the next part, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, one of our recent studies that aims to understand the dynamic mechanical behaviors of certain bio-inspired nanocomposites. So in this case, we, we focus on this Naker structure, right? So Naker is the inner layer of the molluscular shell. Yeah. So this, um, so it has this very, unique layered uh, soft and hard physics. Previous study have found that with this unique nanostructure, it can, uh, the first thing, it can increase the, the, the strength and toughness at the same time. And people have also found that it defy the rule of mixture. So basically when you combine soft and hard, it actually uh, leads to a higher factor toughness by, than the rule of mixtures of the building blocks. Again, the reason is because of the unique nanostructure of, of, of this nature. So a lot of study have been devoted into understanding this unique features of this, this layer, nano-layered nature structure. Uh, uh, however, there has been <clears throat> comparatively much less studies on this across thickness behavior, uh, in this thickness behavior of the nature. Uh, much less has, uh, studies have been devoted to understand how uh, this dynamic mechanical behavior when you, when this, this structure experiencing dynamic loading in the cyclic direction. Well, this type of loading is, is very uh, universal, right? So this, this shell usually needs to resist impact from predators, 
uh, predators usually like smash the shells and, 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 and exert a dynamic loading in the sickly direction. While the tenaker should have excellent impact resistance so that it can protect its inner bodies as much as possible from predators. While the mechanisms in wave propagation in the sickly direction has been much less studied. So now we, we want to utilize our cost growth model to understand the dynamic mechanical behavior under loading in this uh, through thickness direction. Okay, so this is a model we, uh, we uh, constructed. So we have also have this nano layer system. So layer of graphene sheets and layer of a polymer phase. Right, so this like this orange, uh, like we have three layers here. That means three layer of graphene sheets, and this region is is a polymer chain, and we use the Cosgrove model of PMMA uh, in the model here. And we also use uh, just simple Lana Jones potential to represent the interfacial properties, and we can uniquely design the nano structure. Right, so we can adopt different layer thickness, and we have uh, like different structures here, and then we apply. A impact loading from one end and observe how stress propagates through the structure and how this nanostructure dissipate energy under this impact loading. Uh, so this is basically okay. So we initiate the impact and they will we observe this dynamic response of the nanostructures. Um, similarly for this case as well. <clears throat> right. So in the simulation, uh, we can systematically look into under this impact loading how stress wave propagates through the nanostructure and how those uh, in interfaces, what's the unique role of the interfaces and what's the unique role of the nanostructures. Uh, this is all interesting questions that we can answer from uh, those, those simulations. So we found that, okay, so we can track the stress and density contour uh, as under the impact. For this system, there's a very interesting thing happen. That is, there's a large deformation localized in this polymer phase here uh, after this, this stress wave propagates through, okay? So we um, so we analyze the stress wave and we found that, so this, this, we call this creasing deformation of the polymer phase. This creasing deformation uh, is resulted from two major tensile, uh, like tensile wave meet each other, right? So, so one wave, uh, one tensile wave reflected from the free end, so which is compressive wave, uh, when it reflects from the free end, it will lead to a tensile wave. The other tensile wave is the so-called release wave, release wave in the structure. So when this release wave meets the reflected tensile wave, it will lead to localized deformation of the uh, polymer phase. Right? This is, oh, and and so ideally speaking, right? So we want to activate the polymer, the large deformation of the polymer phase for impact resistant application, right? Because those large deformation of polymer is a plastic deformation and it can absorb energy uh, within within the, the structure, right? So this is uh, highly favorable when absorbing energy, right? So next is we see, okay, how we can ac activate this large deformation on polymer. So first we see that when we gradually increase the, uh, the impact velocity, right? So when the velocity is small, then the wave, the wave is not strong enough to activate the uh, the large deformation, right? Well, when, when do you need a critical velocity to activate this this large deformation on point? So that that's uh, a good uh, well understood. So another thing is we want to understand how those large deformation can absorb energy. So in that sense, we we calculate that the overall dissipating energy through the large deformation in the structure. And we use this, this ratio between the absorbed energy over, uh, over the input energy. Input energy is the uh, initial kinetic energy you, you input in the system, basically originated from the impact. But we use this ratio between this dissipated energy versus input energy. And we plot this, this dissipation ratio over impact velocity. And we found that, okay, so there's a critical velocity that achieved the maximum dissipation ratio. So uh, we want to, to achieve very large dissipation ratio because that's the most efficient uh, energy absorption absorption state uh, status, right? So that so we found that okay, so that critical case cor correlate with when this crazy deformation just happens, 
So when this creasing deformation just activated, it has a maximum dissipation ratio. Well, we further increase the velocity. Yeah, you can somehow increase the dissipating energy a bit, but because the input energy is much, much higher, so the dissipation ratio will gradually decrease. So which means the efficiency of the energy absorption becomes lower and lower. So there seems to be an optimized case for the energy absorption capability of the nanostructure. And that case marks where the, when this increasing a large deformation of polymer is just activated. We also like tune this interfacial interaction between uh, graphene and polymer. We found that uh, when this interfacial energy is very weak, basically when this interface is very weak, so usually when after impact, if you will have this interface clean separation. That is not good. So basically when you impact on it, it just uh, disintegrated and does not uh, absorb much energy. So you will need a critical interfacial strength to so that you can activate the large deformation of polymer because you want to keep this interfacial uh, strength strong so that the, the, the deformation can be activated in the polymer phase. But there's usually mark a critical interfacial strength value that uh, the polymer deformation can be activated. And we want this polymer deformation to be activated because, right, because the dissipation ratio is higher when the, when the large deformation of polymer is activated. Right, so we want you. You need to have a certain strength between graphene and polymer when you design this nano-layered uh, material system. Otherwise, it, it cannot absorb energy because usually it leads to interfacial failure. Okay, so this is our uh, still our ongoing study, and we want to to basically uh, understand more into how this nanostructure and how those interfaces uh, interact with stress wave propagation and interacts with energy dissipation. Uh, to summarize this part of work, and we have already found that this alternating arrangement of the graphene sheets and PMMA phase, uh, it can be used to optimize the implant properties. It can be also make tunable towards the impact resistance when the stress wave propagating through the interfa interface directions. Right? We also found that this interface between this uh, soft and, and rigid phase, in our case, which is uh, graphene and polymer phase. So this interaction significantly influence the wave propagation and influence the large deformation behavior of the nanocomposites. If we want to activate the large deformation of PMMA phase, and, and two ways to activate it, right? you need to have a critical impact energy. Right? You, you need to activate a, a, a critical stress wave. Second thing is you, you need to make the interfacial strengths strong enough so that it does not have a clean separation under impact, right? That's a, that's a key conclusions for this part of work. So again, we, we have leveraged the Cosmo model we have developed uh, for different building blocks. And now we move towards the next phase, which is the nanostructure system and, and nanocomposites. And we want to understand their unique mechanical properties and for different applications, right? This application is impact resistance. We can have other application-driven investigations towards uh, those nanostructure systems. So with that, I think I'd, uh, I just uh, stop here. Um, and and, and, and uh, I'm happy to answer any of your uh, questions. Uh, thanks, Joshua. Very interesting talk. So uh, if we, uh, our audience, you, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask Dr. Mon directly. <clears throat> yes, please. So may I ask a question first? Mm -hmm. so, so for the dynamic impact case, so you mentioned that the interfacial strength is critical to, to perform the, the impact test. So, yes. so how, how, how can you ensure that the interfacial strength is stronger than the, the bulk phase of the polymers so that the, all the failure is happening inside the, the polymer phase? Yeah, that, that's exactly the case. Yeah, we want this, uh, this interfacial strength needs to be, uh, like the cohesive energy there needs to be like uh, larger than the, uh, the, 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 the cohesive energy of the polymer phase. Uh, that, yeah, you just, uh, you just need to, to increase energy there. So in our model, we just try different uh, 
like Leonard Jones potential, like uh, Leonard Jones parameters, different energy, energetic parameters, and see when the when that parameter, this parameter is very small, a interfacial separation, and when we gradually increase that value, then it will transition into the uh, internal deformation of the polymer phase. Okay. Okay, you, you just use the, the, the uh, epsilon to control the interfacial strengths, right? Yes, yes. Okay, the second question is about uh, 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 in the first uh, uh, case study, you, you, you introduced the, for the dissipation of the nano composites, you mentioned that there is, uh, uh, there is a snip motion between the, the graph and layer. Mm -hmm. So, so you you mentioned this will be the main mecha mechanism to dissipate the energy inside the nanocomposites. Yes. So, do you consider if you have some, um, uh, uh, for example, the the surface structure? If you introduce some surface structure, this will also increase the dissipation between the the polymer phase and the graphene phase. It, is that possible also increase the dissipation rate inside this uh, composite system? Yeah, I think that's also another uh, mechanism that can increase the energy dissipation. So that is uh, the interfacial dissipation uh, between graphene and polymer. Um, and that, uh, again, yeah, you need that, that, that uh, interfacial strength to be weak so that that can dissipate energy but that's usually not favored because we want the, the allocation between graphene and polymer to be strong so that the, the storage modulus is 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 high or elastic modulus to be high so we want to make that strength, interfacial strength as high as possible so that the storage modulus is 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 is, is quite uh, satisfy our need but like one a very interesting thing that you can so you can increase that allocation energy that's fine but you can somehow leverage the, the internal dissipation of graphene, right? So that does not influence the storage modulus, but that will increase the, uh, the, the, the dissipated energy. So this is one interesting feature that can not only increase the strength, but also increase the uh, dissipated uh, behavior of the nanocomposites. So this is a win-win situation uh, compared to the interfacial strength between polymer and graphene. Okay, so instead of the sliding, and uh, do you observe any detachment between the, the two layer of the graphene? Detachment, no. Uh, so I think that's may also due to the, the deformation we apply to this. So we just apply like shear deformation to the system. Um, but even we, let's say we try to apply like tension in that deformation, I, I don't think so because usually the location energy between graphene layers, that, that's usually quite strong. So you cannot detach the graphene layers. But in this case, because we use this wrinkle configuration to decrease the shear barrier, and this is uh, interesting so that like it can be activated in shear, but the separation will be very difficult to, to, to achieve, I would say. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. So any other question from our audience? Yeah, I think if you uh, you have uh, questions at a later date, uh, just uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to to answer your questions if you uh, you you have certain questions after the seminar. Okay, so so uh, if you have uh, a question later, you can contact Dr. Mong directly by email. So then, and uh, today then we will end here, and then thank thank you all for your uh, attending. The, the seminar and the, yeah, welcome to to join our seminar and uh, number twenty three and uh, next week. Okay, thank you. Bye bye.